Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Okay. Um, all right, so we have a lot to cover. Uh, hash joins. We probably could have done this in two lectures, but we'll try to cram through as much as we can. Um, the where we picked off last class was we showed how to take a a, a query plan, identify what data it's going to access, break that data up into smaller units called morsels. Uh, it's one approach we looked at, and then have them pull from some kind of global queue, right? And and we we said that the pool based approach was going to be superior than a push based approach for scheduling. Um, and that morsels is in by itself the techniques of like the low-level implementation of it may differ from one step to the next. But the idea that I'm going to break up large chunks of data into smaller parts, that's not unique to the morsels idea. That's an old that's an old idea in in in, in parallel systems or parallel data systems. So, and as I said at the end, that the although we ran out of time, basically all the papers we discussed last class were all about single node data systems. But when you go distributed. It's more or less the same thing, right? Just now you may need to account for network latency uh, in, you know, between nodes rather than just like, assume everything's on, in the same box. And whether or not you want to have your, uh, your scheduler plan individual tasks or cores in each single node, or whether you use sort of a hierarchical approach or say, here's the bunch of tasks I want to run, send, send that to a, uh, a node, and the node decides how to divide up to different workers, right? There's different approaches. There's, there's pros and cons to both of them, but we're, we're not going to really cover those. The one thing that we ran out of class, we ran out of time. I want to briefly discuss because this this, gonna, this is going to come up when we start talking about uh, real world implementations of systems is the the notion between dynamic scaling and work stealing, a way to allow the system to sort of rebalance itself and improve performance rather than getting stuck behind stragglers. And these are not mutually exclusive. Like Snowflake is listening on both of these. Snowflake will do both of these. Some systems will do some, you know, if it's a, a, a cloud-based system, you can, you can do the dynamic scaling because you have, you have additional resources. If you're stuck to a single node box the way the hyper was, you cannot. Right, so dynamic scaling basically says that you recognize that before, when it, before a query starts running that I maybe have more tasks than I uh, have n workers for, and I know that can make things slower for me. So therefore, maybe I want to temporarily include some additional resources, scale out horizontally, add more workers to allow the, that process that query so that it runs more quickly. And so we'll see this in Snowflake. They'll have something called flexible compute, where they basically have this side cluster available to all customers for additional workers, and that you can occasionally borrow some without paying extra and make your queries run, run a little bit faster. Again, we can't do that. It's hard to do that on-prem, all right, because you, you, know, you have to provision hardware ahead of time. But in the cloud, all right, everything's elastic, and that makes it easier. And then work stealing, again, we, we, we covered last time, basically says you allow a worker to take work from another, another, another peer. And then whether or not you want to uh, have that, you know, the, the worker that's stealing, the stealer, whether they should go move data from the, uh, from, from the stealee, the, work, the, the worker they're stealing from, get the data from them, or go back to the, the distributed storage, the S3 or whatever. Again, depends on the implementation. Snowflake's going to always go back to the remote storage because they don't want to slow down the worker that is, that's the straggler. But in case of Hyper, we saw that it'll go get it directly from, from the worker CPU. In that case, because everything was in memory. Right? Again, these are just additional design decisions we can, we can account for when, when we build a, a, a larger system. All right, so today I want to focus on, on joins, right? Because joins are the most important, you know, one of, or the, if not, one of the most or the most important operator you would have in a, a relational database system. And we're really going to be focused on how we do this in parallel. And again, we're going to focus on, on a single node system because we're going to assume that something else above us has already moved the data to where we need it to, needed to be. Right? And again, that's not interesting. That just says, OK, this needs data needs to go here. And then something, something moves that. Um, but what we really care about is when we get all the data on a, on a single node, assuming that everything fits in memory, how can we run it as fast as possible? All right? So again, we'll talk about the background of what the different sort of parallel join algorithms or high performance join algorithms look like for the last 30, 40, 50 years. Then we'll talk about the basic building blocks to do a parallel hash join. Then we'll talk about different hash functions, the, the hashing schemes, and the uh, sort of high level overview of, of, the, of the, or the evaluation for the paper you guys read, which I understand the paper was a bit inscrutable for some of you because there's some background material you maybe not have. I'll try to you know, ask questions. I'll try to cover that as we go along. Okay. All right. 
So parallel joint aggregates. Again, the basic idea is that we want to be able to take two relations to join it together uh, on, across multiple workers at the same time to speed things up. Right? In the intro class, we didn't discuss threads or workers when we did joins. We just said, hey, here's the joint algorithm. And then we computed the complexity of it based on the number of pages it had to read and write from disk. Again, as I said, if we assume now everything resides in memory, and now we have additional cores, right? because this is 721, not 445, 645, we have all these additional resources for us. How can we get this to run as fast as possible? So again, we're going to be focused on binary joins or just taking two relations. Next class, we'll talk about multi-way joins or, or, or uh, three-way joins, um, three or more. And the idea is that can you join multiple tables exactly at the same time? And we'll see an algorithm to do that. Most of the times, though, for most queries, you want to do a binary join. That's going to be faster than the multi-way join. Well, it's, for graph workloads, the multi-way join would be better. So the two main approaches that we're going to care about are hash join and sort merge join. I'm not teaching sort merge join this year just because most systems aren't going to implement it. Right? And you know, nine times out of 10 or 99 times out of 100, you're going to want the hash join. Right, that's always going to be faster. Um, if, if the thing's already sorted in the way you want it to, on the join key, then yeah, you could do a sort merge join. Uh, and the paper you read about talked about some ways to speed that up using SIMD and other things. But for now, I, I don't think it's necessary to know, know that. I'd rather focus on how can we do hash join faster. We're also not going to talk about nested loop joins because this is almost always the worst thing to possibly do in, a, in an OLAP system. Uh, you would only do this if you know like the table has like 10 tuples, right? Uh, and so again, hash join is almost always going to be preferable to everything else. So, and so the goal of today is again how to match my parallelism, and part of that is going to be being aware of what the CPU wants from us, being aware of what the threads are reading and writing to to avoid synchronization costs, uh, and understanding the you know the penalties of reading data that's in a different numeric region or maybe that's unaligned. So it didn't know it didn't know, didn't always used to be that hash join was considered to be superior to everything else. Um, this is sort of a classic debate in, in databases where it's gone back and forth between whether sorting is faster for joins versus hashing. And back in the 1970s, in the first database systems that were running on you know, very, very primitive early computers, uh, you know, the, they needed to handle tables that were larger than memory. The, the grace hash join, or how, how to spill joins to disk, wasn't invented yet. So, but they had an external merge sort algorithm. So they said, OK, well, if I need to join two tables that are really big, bigger than the amount of memory I have, again, think of like megabytes, uh, not, not, you know, not terabytes of memory, or kilobytes in some cases, that they had a way to then be able to do external merge sort so they could write the sorted data out the disk, bring them in as, as partitions or chunks, and then do the, the merge pass to join them. In the 1980s, uh, the hardware got better. Uh, and then the, you know, the, there was this project out of Japan called the Grace, Grace Database Machine. And so they invented the Grace hash join, which is a precursor to the partition join that we're talking about today. And that, they had the ability then to be, be able to spill the buckets to disk uh, recursively to bring things up to smaller chunks uh, that could fit in memory. There was another movement called database machines, which, which the Grace project was part of. And that was like specialized hardware that had custom silicon just to do hash joins. All right? So they had ways to speed up hash joins back in the day. In the 1990s, uh, an early paper came out from Gertz Graffy, the guy that invented Volcano, the Volcano model, the iterator model, the guy that invented the exchange operator, the guy that invented Cascades, who we'll cover later on. Right? He had a paper that basically said these two algorithms were equivalent given the, modern, given the hardware that was available at the time. But since the 2000s, since the turn of the century, hashing has been shown to be uh, preferable. Uh, and so the question is always now, is it, is it better to partition or not? Um, and in the paper you guys read, I think they show partitioning is going to be faster. There's, a, there's another paper from other Germans, from the hyper Germans, the Umbra Germans, that said, yes, partitioning is faster, but it's really hard to get it right. So most of the times you're better off not partitioning. Uh, sorry, not the partitioning is faster, but you're better off not partitioning because it can cover most, it's good enough for most things. Right? So this is what we're going to focus on, on today. We're going to ignore sort merge join, and we're really going to discuss the partition versus not partition approaches and in, in, in the modern variants of these things. For sort merge join, the paper that they, uh, I think the M-way sort merge join paper that they cite, the paper you guys read, that's from Intel, actually I'll show the next slide, from Intel and Oracle uh, from the, the 2009 that basically said, hey, sort merge will be better than hash join if you have uh, SIMD registers that have 512 bits. Because again, this is in 2009, before AVX 512 came along. 
But now if the AVX512 is around, and hashing, I think, is still considered preferable. Now again, if your data is already sorted on the join key, then yeah, that's always going to be faster than hash join. Uh, but you know, most of the times it's not, especially in a, you know, in the lake house or the, the data lake environment we're, we're talking about, where someone's just writing out random parquet files, and it's your job to to, to join them together. So things are almost never going to be sorted on the on the join key. They're never going to be partitioned on the join key either. All right, so that was two thousand nine. Uh, hashing was faster, if you had, but if you had AVX 512, you, you could get better. And then there was a paper from Wisconsin, actually from Jignesh and his student, that basically showed how the, the early work that showed the, the trade-offs between the partitioning hash join versus the non-partitioning hash join. Um, and, in, in, and in their approach, I think they said that the partitioning one was actually was better. Then the hyper guys came out in a paper uh, in the next year, in 2012, said, well, it turns out Cerberus join, if you do it our way, is even faster than hash join from the Wisconsin people and without, doing, without requiring AVX 512, right? Just using the hardware that they at the time, with Hyper, they could do sort merge join faster. But then they came back a year later and said, ignore what we said in this paper. <laughs> uh, you really want to use hashing, and here's the way we did it, and uh, look how much faster it is. <laughs> then another paper around the same time in 2013 from uh, other Germans, or I guess Swiss Germans, uh, that they said, here's, here's additional optimizations you can do, and here's how to make the Radix hash join, which we'll cover today, go faster. Then there's a paper you guys read from different Germans uh, at Saarland. They basically said everybody's, you know, everybody's is showing these different numbers and these different results, and it's really hard to compare an apple apple, uh, have an apple uh, apple to apple comparison between these different approaches because they're measuring different things, they're different implementations, running on different hardware, different workloads, different everything. And the idea was to have a single paper, you know, look at all of them, right? But again, this is going to be a uh, this is going to be a a, a test bed system. Uh, so they are going to materialize the tuples as if it was a real engine, but it's it's not going to have the you know it's not a complete system like Hyper or Umbra is going to be. And then lastly, the most recent paper, sort of in the space that is, you know sort of matters, which I didn't have you guys read from the the Umbra guys, which again the same Germans as the Hyper Germans, uh, and they basically said Radex hash join is faster in a larger system in a full system like Umbra. But the challenge is going to be when to know when you actually want to use it, because there's these different design, different, uh, different aspects of the of the workload and the data and the hardware that you have to account for when you want to decide how to to to, you know, to, to use Radix hash join correctly, right? And most of the systems, as far as I know, like the real systems that are out there today, they're not going to implement, you know, the the, the Radix hash join versus the 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 the, the, not, the partition hash join, but the non-partition hash join, they're not going to implement, usually don't implement different hash table implementations. ClickHouse is the exception. We'll cover that in a second. Uh, and so everyone sort of picks one, and, and it's good enough. And in the paper you guys read from, from the Saarland Germans, they basically said, you know, hash join's important, but it's not the most, you know, it's not where you're spending all your time in, in queries. And so you're probably better off uh, optimizing other things which we've been saying throughout the semester, that there's not like one, the, the, sort of the, the, the current state of the research and, and of database systems is that there's not one thing you could point to, like this is the biggest problem, we've got to fix this. It's a combination of a bunch of things. So yes, if you have a really crappy join algorithm, then yeah, that's going to be a dominating cost of your, of your system. But once you start implementing the basic optimizations that we'll talk about today, you know, separate from the, the partition versus non-partition one, like, you're not going to shave off a, a large number of, 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 of more cycles or more time in queries, to be trying to make your hash run even faster. I had my one student, Prashant, my, my previous PhD student, who's now at Databricks working on Photon. Uh, he spent about a half a year looking at some of these earlier works, I mean, from these guys and these guys, like trying to make their hash joins faster. And he, we, we were going, like we were literally counting cycles per tuple. Like he got it down from like 12 cycles per tuple to like 11 cycles per tuple. And like in the end, it doesn't matter. And we, we, we never publish anything about it. Anyway, so anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll cover the different approaches as we go along. But the important thing to cover now is, is, is discuss is how we want to design our algorithm and what is the overarching theme of how we want to make decisions about certain trade-offs of, of our implementation. And this is going to come down to whether our uh, whether implementation is going to be considered hardware-conscious or hardware-oblivious. Anybody know what these terms mean? I think the paper covered it. What does it mean, hardware oblivious? What does oblivious mean? Okay. You don't know. Yeah. 
So meaning like the algorithm doesn't know, doesn't care about what the, what the cache size is, the number of threads are, what the TLB size is, right? It's just like sort of, there's a standard algorithm. You try to do the best you can being without tuning specific things to the actual hardware. Hardware conscious is the opposite. It's saying like, okay, I'm going to try to look at all the low-level uh, information specifications about the hardware that I'm running on, like the cache sizes, like the, the NUMA regions and so forth, and then have my algorithm make decisions of how to divide things up and move things around based on, based on that. Right? There's trade-offs to each of these. Obviously, that in, if I'm hardware oblivious, then I write it once, and, that, and that's good enough for everywhere. Hardware conscious means that I have to have specific optimizations that may not work anymore as hardware evolves over time. Or if I go, you know, if somehow something, there's in something, something in Xeons or x86 is completely different than something in ARM, then my algorithms will, 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 will not, you know, will not scale in the other, other uh, ISA or other architecture. All right, so within this, we want to have sort of two goals of how we want to implement our algorithms. First of that, we obviously want to minimize synchronization. And this means that since, it, since we're talking about a parallel join algorithm, we have to have multiple threads or multiple workers running at the same time. And we want to reduce the amount of communication we have between those threads so that one thread can continue working and not get blocked on uh, you know, another thread you know, filling up some, some buffer or hash table. Right? So again, we want our threads to be able to run full three, uh, sorry, at full speed. Um, so this doesn't mean that we want to make our, our implementation lock free or latch free. It just means that we can be careful about when we actually go acquire latches uh, so that you know, it's not everyone trying to clobber each other all the time. The, the second goal is to minimize uh, the, the cost of going accessing memory. Um, and this means that we want the data that any threads going to be operating on or working on to be local to it, ideally in, in its caches. Uh, if not in you know, L1, L2, then L3. L3 is shared across different cores, at least in, in, in Xeons, within, within a single socket. Or if I can't have things in my last level cache, I want to have it in my local memory, because right? I want to avoid having to go over, over uh, you know, the, the interconnect across different NUMA regions. And so the way we'll design our algorithms is very similar to how we design algorithms in the intro class, where we are said we, whenever we bring something in from disk, a page in, from disk into memory, we want to do as much work as we can on that, on that piece of data before we throw it away, because we don't want to go fetch the disk again. Or it's the same thing we saw with Hyper, where they wanted to do as much work as they can for a single tuple sitting in a CPU register going up the pipeline before they went back and got another tuple. Because again, the cost of going, you know, put something into memory into, to the, from CPU cache into the register was relatively expensive. Right? So this, this idea is, it shouldn't be foreign, foreign to us. All right, so let's focus, focus how we want to do this. So what can make our, uh, what's going to make our query go slow when you have cache miss? Right? Well, if we, we just fill up our cache with, with a bunch of crap, a bunch of stuff, a bunch, you know, a bunch of data, uh, then yeah, we're not going to have any space to store new, new things. But another challenge is going to be we have to actually consider the TLB on the actual CPU. Because now if, we have, if we're trying to have our thread address a bunch of different you know, uh, cache lines across memory, uh, then if I'm just polluting my cache with all these random cache lines, and now when I do another lookup for some, some other, you know, ca another cache line, not only is it not going to be in my CPU cache because I got it, the CPU evicted and put it out to memory, but it's also the entry is not going to be in my TLB. So I'm actually going to pay two cache, cache misses right, to do, do one single lookup. So I want to be careful about how I'm bringing in, uh, bringing in my data and make sure, again, I, I reuse as much as I can before I move on to the next thing. Basically, I want to avoid doing complete random access. Even though it's memory, we said we could do random access. We want to still be careful about what we're accessing to avoid that issue. Again, it's just like in a disk-based system in the intro class, just now we're at the, like, you know, the a even smaller scale. But it's still going to matter a lot. All right, so I've already started to say that this. We want to avoid random access, right? We want to try to scan as much as possible. Uh, and then when we do have random access, we want to have things be uh, uh, you know, local possible, and that way we're just hitting the, you know, our, our local cache over and over again. So there's going to be this trade-off we'll see when we talk about the radix join, where there's going to be the, the amount of instructions we would have to execute to do something versus the amount of memory we may, we may consume and the amount of cycles we may consume. Again, the idea of, of this partitioning step is that 
if I pre-process my data on both the build side and the probe side of the join and put it in these nice little chunks that, that, can, that, that will only be accessed by a single thread or single worker, then they're not going to have to go over the interconnect to go get random things, and they can just scan through sequentially on, on these buffers and not communicate with anybody else. So yes, I'm doing more work, but in the end, I'll, be, uh, I'll, I'll, pay, I'll have fewer cycles because there won't be, again, uh, traffic on, on the hardware. All right, so as I already said, the hash join is the most important operator we're going to have in our database system. Um, again, we'll see at the end that it's not always going to be the, most, the, the dominant cost. But nevertheless, this is what most people want to do in, in an OLAP system, lots of joins. So we want to make this go go fast as possible. And ideally, again, we want to have our all the cores running at full capacity, 100% utilization when, while we're doing our join, and minimize all, all the stalls of going you know, getting things from DRAM and putting into our CPU caches. All right, so at a high level, hash join has three steps, where the first step is optional. So in the first step, as I already said, is this partition phase, where it, you could decide that I want to take the, the tuples that are coming up into my join operator on the build side and the, and the, the probe side, or the, the inner and the outer relation, um, and I'm going to break them up into these shards or partitions uh, based on the hash key that, or sorry, based on the hashing of the join key that, that being used in the join operator. And I'll divide them up into different chunks, and then the threads could then, then on, the, the, on the build side, you could then build the hash table at each worker using these, these joint subsets. And then on the probe side, same thing, different workers will do probing to the hash table on the joint subsets. Then on the build side, as I said, again, we're gonna actually build the hash table. So as this, we're gonna assume we have a single hash table, uh, single logical hash table. In some cases, you can have multiple physical ones that are uh, that are still in front of a single interface. Um, we'll cover that in a second. But it's a single hash table, and that, that prevents me from having any false negatives where I do a probe or something should exist, but because it's in a different hash table or a different location, then I end up incorrectly missing it. Right? And, that, again, that, and that's the probe phase. So again, you do a lookup. If you find a match, we'll talk about how to find a match in a second, uh, then you take the, the tuple from the, from the outer relation, the tuple from the inner relation, match the two together, and then shove that up the pipeline as, as the output. Right? So the Sarlin paper you guys read that from these Germans, they correctly make a big deal that th this materialization cost, this last step here, is actually does matter a lot. Uh, and a lot of the earlier papers don't, you know, didn't actually do any of this. Right? And they said, you know, just how fast can you do the build and probe the partition? And the reason why this matters is because this is like a mem copy to take the out, you know, you're taking two pieces of, of data, mash them together, and produce in the output. And that's additional pressure on the CPU cache, which, if you're not doing it, may give you f uh, incorrect readings or the wrong perception about the, the, the speed of certain operations for the other parts. So you always want to do this, because that's what a real system would have to do anyway. We didn't cover the, the paper from the Columbia guys on the SIMD stuff, but like, when they were showing how to do like, vectorized hash joins or ha uh, hash lookups and so forth, they literally, like, I found a match and literally threw it away, because they were trying to keep everything in, in L3 cache Otherwise, SIMD didn't make a difference. So this is showing in a, in a full system you'd have to do this. And again, they're including that in the calculation. And we'll discuss the, the pros and cons of early and late materialization uh, later on. All right, so let's go through the partition, each of the, the three phases. Again, we'll spend a lot of time on the partition phase because uh, I think there was some confusion on that in the paper. And I think this is, it's, you know, it's, it's good to see how these systems actually could do it, even though you may, if you have, end up building a system, you may actually not want to do this partitioning stuff. But it's good to understand what's actually going on, because some of the trade-offs and design decisions that they're going to make for how they're going to implement this are useful for other parts of the system, like being aware of, of the, you know, cache locality and so forth. All right, so the partition phase, you're going to take the input relations on the, the outer and the inner, and you're going to part, put them into partition buffers based on the join key. And the idea is that you're going to take these buffers, or these partitions, you're going to redistribute them across the different cores, and then when you now go into the build phase or the probe phase, the workers will be assigned those partitions. And they only have to communicate, only have to read data within those partitions. And now you're just doing, you know, doing a sequential scan in that, in that buffer. And the goal of this is that, especially in a, in a numer architecture, that the extra instructions we're going to spend to do this extra partitioning step uh, will, be, will overcome the, uh, the, the, the extra cost of the instructions, running the instructions to do the partition step, and therefore getting better locality of the data at each thread 
that's going to be faster than blindly just having every thread reading different, different parts of memory. So in some cases, the data will actually already be partitioned for you. This is rare, right? This, if the data is already you know, partitioned on the join key, then you, you don't have to do this extra step. You literally can just say, okay, you know, take the first thousand tuples, you go here, next thousand tuples go there, right? But that, again, that doesn't always happen. And so again, this, this idea comes from the greatest hash drawing. We saw it in the intro class, but that was like spilling to buckets on disk. Let's see how we do it in memory. All right, so there's two high level approaches to doing this, the, the non-blocking and the blocking approach. And the non-blocking, Approach, the idea is that we're going to uh, just have the threads access to the data at the, at the same time uh, and populate a single hash table without really without doing any so without doing any extra sophisticated things to, clean, to, to split things up. We're literally just letting them write out to these these buffers, and any any thread can write to any buffer, and therefore we have to use latches to synchronize to make sure that they don't clobber each other or cause problems in our in our data structure, right? And then the blocking approach, or the radius approach, this is we're going to scan the, potentially scan the population multiple times, but then the, we're going to be clever about how we actually write data into these partitions based on the radix to avoid having to do any synchronization across the different threads. So this is the one that's more sophisticated, uh, but again, it, it, it requires a bit more preprocessing before doing the one at the top. And there's actually two vari variations of the one at the top, so we'll cover both of them. So the, again, the non-blocking non partition is like we're just going to let any thread, so all the threads are going to run at the same time to generate, generate our partitions. And the question is going to be, do we have the threads write to a, a single global shared partitions, which we have to protect using latches, or do we have them write to private partitions, think of like almost like thread local storage, and that way there's no synchronization. But then now I've got to do another pass at the end to put them, have one thread put them into... The, the, the shared partitions, or our global partition. Yes? In non-blocking, how would you even have private partitions? Because in order to have private partitions, you would need like a radix to actually partition them based on, right? Or you know. Your question is, for non-blocking, how would you actually even do this without radix partitioning? Yeah. Uh, next, next slide. It, like, literally, it's like, everyone ha like I, say I have 10 partitions. Every core is going to have 10 mini partitions, right? Okay. And, then at, and then something at the end just puts them all together. Radix partitioning is trying to be clever for having one, one buffer space, but I know what offset I want to write into. Let, let's go through the example. If you're so confused, we can come back. All right, so here's our data table. Say we do the really simple thing of like this, in the very beginning, splitting up in row groups or morsels, right? And this, say this column B is what, we, what our join key is. So we're going to hash this join key, and then, oops, sorry. We're going to hash this join key, and then that's going to determine which, the, which, my, which my end partitions I want to write into. So literally, think of this, every single core is just writing to any other, any partition at once. And think of these as just linked lists of, of buffers, right? Almost like a change hash table. And so to prevent the, the threads from overwriting each other call it, or corrupting the data structure, I got to take latches on the buckets whenever I write into it because I don't know whether another thread's writing to the same time, right? But at the end, when I'm, when I'm done, uh, you know, when, I, when I'm done the, I'm done populating these different partitions. I don't need to do any cleanup or uh, con consolidation because now you know core one could take this one, core two could take this this partition. Everything's all cleaning divide up. But I pay this extra, I pay this penalty of coordinating uh, or using synchronization to to make sure that threads don't kill each other when they're writing to the partitions at the you know at, at the you know at the, at the population step. So this is this is the uh, the shared partitions. The private partitions is where now every core itself. Has this you know has n partitions for the you know for which is the total number that I'm going to have at the very end. So say I want I want ten partitions that I'm going to hand off to ten cores. Within each core now, this first step here, I'm going to have ten mini partitions. And now each core can write into these things without anybody uh, you know clobbering them. So I don't need to take any latches because I know everything's single threaded and it'll be super fast. But now the downside is I I, I want to consolidate like for a partition one across my different cores. I want to put them into a, a single partition one. So I have to do another pass where uh, you could have each core, uh, or sort of one core be in charge of taking the data across the, the mini partitions and putting it together into the, a global one. All right? So what's the downside of this? 
Was it the, I mean, yeah, the last stage, yes. Uh, so in, the, in this case here, when I'm doing this initial pass, right, I have, say in this core here, I have this chunk of data, it's in my, you know, it's in my L3 cache. I don't need to go across any NUMA region uh, to go access anything else because I don't care about anything. I only care about this data here. And likewise, when I write it out, assuming the partitions fit my L3 cache, then I'm just writing to, to my, you know, my, my local CPU cache. But now, now when I want to do this consolidation step, this core is in some other NUMA region, and it's got to go touch all the, the, the you know, partition ones across all the other cores, which may be in a different NUMA region. And then I've got to write this back now into my NUMA region. So, that, so that's expensive, right? So this is, another good, this is actually a good example also, too, of, of the pros and cons between like late materialization and early materialization. Because if I'm doing late materialization, then the data that I'm actually moving around here could just be like the join key and the tuple ID, right? It could be kind of small. But if I'm doing early materialization and I, and I have like you know, 20 columns, then this partitioning step here is, is moving potentially 20 columns around, plus going across newer regions, which is, which is, which is always going to be bad. But it doesn't require locks, so it's probably better? It's the same as it doesn't require locks, so it's potentially better. Depends, right? Like if I have multiple newer regions, then maybe this is bad, right? So this gets into like the Harvard oblivious versus Harvard con like consciousness. Like, in order to decide whether I want to do this or not, uh, then I, I, I have to go look like maybe like run micro benchmarks or something to figure out when the system boots up like what is, is the Harvard cap capable of. And that even then that might not work out when I actually run it in the real time because you know the, the data is heavily skewed. Then you know you know one one set of partitions might be super big versus another one. Yes. Uh, on the previous slide, with the, with just the local partition, not local. Correct. So the statement is, in this one here, actually this one you, d you definitely would, yeah, yeah. right? The statement is, in, in this one here, are the cores potentially going to have to access data that's uh, across numerous regions? Yes, when it writes into these partitions, these partitions are not, not going to fit in L3 cache, and they can be in different, in different numerous regions. So then local partitioning is definitely better. The statement is, is local partitioning definitely better? Meaning like the, the private versus shared? Again, it depends. Yes. For the private partitions, how exactly are the, um, the local partitions getting joined? Are they just like literally appending them together? This question is, in this last step here, how, how, how am I generating, how is this thing getting generated? It's, it's you, like you're literally just sequential scanning through memory yeah. and just appending it, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, there's no additional processing you'd want to do. It's literally just copying. Yes. So, Your statement is, uh, wouldn't it be better to have each core have their local partitions in their cache, yeah. which, which they do? Yes. Oh. The, like th this thing here, like, th like again, so I, I've say, uh, 10 partitions. This core is going to have 10 mini partitions. Right. And that's all going to be ideal in, in its L3 right. cache. And then for the, the, the last part, the this last step here, wouldn't it be better for this to be where? In the last step, I have to consolidate. So like this core is going to be responsible for partition one. So it goes to, to partition one and the ten, for the mini partitions of each core, has to copy the data and put it into the, the final uh, buffers. And assuming that, because you, you want to write memory that's local to you, so partition one is going to end up being in you know, CPU one's uh, you know, caches or local memory. The question is, is there any contention when you're trying to do, do, join, again, join them together? Contention from what, though? Because you know, CPU 1 is the only one reading mini partition 1, oh, right, okay. right? So there's, there's no coordination. There's no synchronization needed. So it's last free. Yes? The number of partitions always equal to the number of cores. The question is, is the number of partitions always equal to the number of cores? No. Then how do you determine how many partitions you want? The question is, how do you determine the number of partitions you want? Whatever can fit in this cache? No, I mean, it, it depends. Like, it depends on the skew of the data, right? Like, so simplicity, you could just say, yes, yeah, the number of cores. But then what happens when the, again, say this data is like super heavily skewed, and 
you know, there, there's a billion keys in partition one and, and, and like a thousand keys in all of the other ones. Well, now I got to partition this one again, right? So you end up with more partitions than, 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 uh, than cores. Yes? Uh, is this last step being done using SIMD? Are we like taking these mini partitions using SIMD putting them into them? This question is, is this last step being done with SIMD? It's just mem copying. So there's not, I don't, SIMD wouldn't really help. question is, why do we have to do this last step? Why can't, when I build the hash table, just jump, you know, know what the, because then, because now when you're doing the, the, well, first of all, two things. This is, but you're doing this both on the build side and the probe side, right? So now if you have a thread scanning through uh, to do, you know, to build or do the, do the build or do the probe, like, now you're kind of doing the jumbling again. It's, I guess, it, 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 at a high level, it's the same, I guess. Right, uh, but it's like you're staging things so that when you, when then you then do the, the build of the probe, like there's there's fewer stalls as, as you scan along. So you, so you stall because of the remote memory access during the partition phase, but then you, you don't have any stalls in, in the build or probe side. If we have a larger number of partitions, hence fewer, uh, like less number of uh, contention for the logs. Maybe if we just let one of the cores handle all of its mini partitions and push it to the global partitions rather than having one core handle one set of part mini partitions. His statement is instead of having every th every core be responsible for like some subset of the mini partitions and consolidate them, what if you just have one core do that? No, no, no. So each core takes care of all of its partitions in the right set of global partitioning. So we sort of go back to the global partitioning model, except <laughs> that because if we have a large number of partitions, there would be less contention? Oh, right, so he's basically saying, if you go back here, okay, you know, this is PowerPoint, so I can only show so many. You just had a ton of partitions, then the likelihood that any two thread would be writing to the same thing at the same time. Yep, and so then you'll end up yes. getting a significant advantage over the other approach. I debate whether, I, I, I push back whether it's significant, uh, but yes, if you, if you increase N significantly, then the likelihood, again, that, that two threads try to contend on the same latch would go down, yes. And the downside of that would be, uh, what's that? Yeah, you, it, you know, it depends on how big you're allocating these, these buckets to get, could be underutilized and you're just wasting memory, right? Okay. So let's go through now, let's go through the radix partitioning. Again, the idea is the same, the same uh, but the goal is that we want to only, only materialize results once, whereas the other one we had to materialize it twice, um, at least in the, in the, in the, for, the, for the private partitions. And can, unless you have to do recursive partitioning, but, but that's like, you have to do that for any, any of them. So whenever you see people say, I do a radix hash join, or sometimes it's called a radix join, it's going to be this approach here. All right, so the idea is that we're going to scan through the input relation multiple times. And in the first time, we're just going to gather information about what the data looks like and then use that to determine where we want to write data out to our output buffers when, you know, when, when it's time to actually then do, do the partitioning. So in the first step, we do the first pass, and we compute this histogram, which is just going to be the, be the number of tuples that are, that are going to exist with some radix, which I'll explain what that is in a second. All right? And then we compute the prefix sum, which is just a running, running summation of, the, uh, of, of these, of these uh, from this histogram. And that's going to determine where each partition is going to start within our output buffer. And then we scan now R again, and then we have them write out the data into these buffers based on this partition key. This is just text, so I'll, I'll go through an example. But we've got to go through, understand what the rate x is going to look like and what the prefix sum does. And then that'll tell us how we do this last step here. Okay. All right. So the so the radix is literally just like a digit within a number. So you take the hash of the key you're trying to join on, right, and say the hash ends up being 19, right. And so the 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 radix would just be you know the the, you know, the the one position. What is the number? Like nine, right. And so you can do this just through bit shifting and multiplication. 
and then that can allow you to, to extract out, I just, I just want this one number, right? All right, so what do we do with this? Well, can then we can use this now, right, and get the other one too as well. We can then use this to maintain a histogram that says, for every value within, every radix value, what's the number of entries that we see? And we end up sort of with a, 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 a sorted list like this that says, okay, for, for zero, there's two entries, for one, there's, there's three entries, and for two, there's one entry. And so the idea here is that we're going to use the radix to determine which partition number you're going to go into. And then we're going to use this histogram, compute the prefix sum, which is the next slide, to say, OK, but where within that, this giant buffer of, of my partition data, where does that prefix start? Or where does, that, where does that radix start? So the prefix sum is just taking, again, it's a, it's a rolling summation. So say these are input, one through, one through six. So the prefix sum in the first position is just 1, because you start with 0. So 1 plus 0 equals 1. But then now I'm going to take whatever the number was, was, the, was the sum of the previous addition, take the next number in my input sequence, add those two together, and that's the next value I get. So 1 plus 2 equals 3. And I keep do, doing this down the line, and then now for every, in, within my input sequence, I'm going to have the, the prefix sum. Right? And again, this is we're going we're to do this after we compute the, the radix histogram, send this all now to our threads, and now they're going to know, OK, well, at, at, at this position in my prefix sum, it corresponds to this radix, and therefore I know what offset they're right into. Right? Think of these as just going to be buffer memory offsets into our, our partition buffer. Right? And the reason why we're going to do this is that we don't have to synchronize. So we do this first pass, compute this prefix sum get, for all the radixes, we hand that out to all the threads, and then now when they do the partitioning, they don't need to synchronize at all the, the way we did with the, the latches from, from before. So I don't know if there's a way to, to compute this efficiently prefix sum with, like, with SIMD. Um, there's a paper from Guy Blalock, who's in, here in the computer science department, from like, it's like two, or 1994, 95. And he was envisioning, hey, look, here's how to do vectorized prefix sum if you, had, if, you, you know, if you had SIMD instructions to do it, which at the time they didn't, which, I, again, I still don't think exists. But just, just shows you how awesome Guy is. He's been thinking about this problem for like 30 years. Right? Question, yes? I'm not sure I understand how the prefix sum helps us here. Next slide. So the question is, I don't see how the prefix sum is going to help us. We're going to use this prefix sum to tell us what the offset is when we write into a radix. Next slide. All right, so say this is, our, this is our, our input data, and we've already hashed it, right? So these are all, this is, this, these values here are, are the, is the hash values. So in the first pass of the algorithm, we're going we're gonna to split up like we did before, like in morsels. Let's say we just have two, two CPUs here. And then we're going to take the first position and uh, uh, you know, the first radix of each hash, hash value, and we're going to use that to determine where we want to write the, the data that corresponds to this record. So to do this, we compute the prefix sum for, the, you know, for this input sequence, right? Going like, going like this. And then now that's going to be able to tell us, OK, for partition 0, you know, we want to write uh, two, two slots, right? So in this case here, we have, we have four values. Sorry, two values, 0, 1, 1, 0. So there's two unique values. So we know that for partition 0, according to the first radix, there's two elements in here. So we know that when we write into the, the op, this giant output buffer, we can write it at the first position. For partition one, there's two more elements, but it's, it's two, it's zero plus two. So now we want to start writing at, at the third position in our giant output buffer, right? Like this. So partition zero at CPU zero can write at the first position. Partition zero at CPU one can then write at this one, and so forth, right? So again, and they don't need to coordinate how to do this. They know they're writing into a memory location in a, in a partition buffer that nobody else is going to be writing into. So we can just rip through it and run as fast as possible. Right, so then we just scan through the data, and then we just you know, write it out like that. Now, maybe the case, again, if we, if we have uh, if this is horribly imbalanced where one partition is huge, we can just recursively just do this again by looking at the next, the next radix position and just doing this another, another round. And that'll sub subdivide it even further. All right? Then that is your question. OK. OK. So again, a, a vanilla implementation or a, 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 
a naive implementation of, of these different approaches is going to be super slow because uh, you know, we're, we're reading and writing random locations in memory, and we're polluting our CPU caches as, as we go along. So there are, in the paper you guys read, there are some optimizations you can do to, to, to prove this. The first is going to be using what are called uh, the, the, the software write combined buffers, or the, the write buffers. And the idea here is that instead of me just writing out to, to you know, as I'm scanning along, like writing data here and writing data there as, as I'm scanning through on the partitioning step, I'll write to like a, almost like the private buffers from before, but it's much smaller. I'll write to a little bit to that private buffer. And when that buffer gets filled, then I write to, the, to that remote location. And again, going back to the slide here, since I know that uh, at this step here, I know that nobody else is going to be writing to the range that I'm supposed to write into, it, it's, you know, there won't be any issues if I delay a little bit and then write things out in a batch. Right? And that, that'll help things out. Obviously, being new aware from all this is going to matter a lot, too. But the other trick we can use is called uh, streaming writes or non-temporal streaming writes. And this is a, these are special instructions on in the CPU that allow us to write to a memory location without having the CPU put it into our CPU caches first. It's like you're basically bypassing the CPU cache. Say, I want to write to memory location XYZ. Don't put it in my CPU cache, but the, the, the CPU normally would because it wants to read it in and then overwrite it. You just write it, almost like direct memory access, write it direct to the, to the memory. Yes? The last point, it says without a separate write phase at the end, but there is a separate write phase, right? In which we're buffering everything and uh, uh, writing in the software write combined buffer. But like we don't, like in, in, the, in the, the private buffer is like you wrote to the private buffer, then you wrote to the global buffers, yes. right? And with, with the radix partition, I don't need to do that, right? I do one pass here, and then I know exactly where the data needs to go, and it's one write into that. So there's no extra step now to, 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 to put it as a, a global, global buffer. Right? So anyway, so th there's, there's special instructions. Uh, I know SIMD can do this. You can take things out of the SIMD register and get it right into memory. But I think you can get regular, you know, uh, like regular CPU registers as well can do this. Do this. Right? And so the combination of these things is how you're going to get this actually to work well on, on modern hardware. All right, so now we, so we partitioned. All right, now we have a bunch of data, uh, or the optioning partition. We could have a bunch of data in, in these nice little partitions that are assigned to different cores, or we could just be operating directly on the, on the, the input data itself on, on, the, on the build phase. But the idea is that we're going to take all the data that's coming on the, from the outer relation, in this case, case R, we're going to assume we have, we have to have the, imp, as the input, uh, the input data has to have the, the keys we want to, the columns we want to join on. We're going to hash them and then sort it in some kind of hash table. Uh, and then once that's done, then we switch over to the probe, the probe phase, right? So now we need to discuss how we're going to organize our hash table uh, in this build phase to, you know, to run as fast as possible. So when someone says they have a hash table, they really mean they have two things. They're going to have a hash function, right, something that takes, a, uh, you know, takes an arbitrary bytes of, of some value and map it to an integer value in a smaller domain, uh, typically 32 or 64 bits, right? And then, we, then we, we're going to store this in some kind of data structure, which we'll cover in a few, a few more slides. But then within that data structure, we have, need a way to handle collisions. Because the hash function isn't, going to, isn't always going to guarantee that the hash value for two unique tuples is going to be unique. So we need to figure out what do we do when we have two guys try to go to the same location. Right? So again, we're not an algorithms class. So we're not going to go too much detail about like, what hash function you want to use or what the actual the complexity of the hash tables are. Uh, but we're going to, you know, for the hash functions, we're typically going to use something off the shelf. Most systems do. Uh, some write their own. We'll talk about it in a second. But, like, you take something off the shelf, but it's the hash table we probably want to spend most of our time make sure we get that right, all right, because we want that to be as fast as possible. So for the hash function, there's going to be this trade-off between uh, speed and, and low collision. So the fastest hash function you can have is literally just return one, meaning no matter what key I give you, you always get back one. Because what is that? That's copying from one register to another register. Right? In some cases, the CPU can just inline it, right? Uh, but the, this is going to be terrible for collision because you know, no matter what key I give you, it's going to go to the same location. On the other end of the spectrum, you have perfect hashing, which is gonna be a, a way to guarantee that for any possible hash key or any possible key, I get, I get a new hash value. So a true pure, pure uh, uh, sorry, a, a true perfect hash function 
only exists in like in, in the literature and in, in theoretical papers. Uh, Jignesh is, and his PhD student in Wisconsin are working on sort of practical implementation of this, which we won't cover. But again, it's not truly perfect because you have to handle the corner cases. But for most of the keys, it's, it's good enough. But most systems aren't, aren't going to do what Jignesh is doing in his perfect hash function. They're going to use something off the shelf. So to figure out what hash function you want to use, again, we don't have to implement things ourselves. There's this, um, there's this GitHub repo for this thing called smhasher. And it's basically, in the same way that I'm obsessed about databases, this guy's obsessed about hash functions. Uh, so he has this, this benchmark he runs for every possible hash function that, that exists. And he keeps track of the collision rate and the throughput and the performance of, of, the, of them. Um, and you know, I, I think the, like the Facebook XX hash and the murmur hash, uh, those ones usually rank pretty high. What's that? Yeah, I, I, it's like a no-op. Yeah, it just says no-op. Yeah. So, right, so here's a smattering of the ones that probably uh, you'd want to consider for your database system. So the, the, one, the easiest and fastest ones to use is one of the oldest ones, uh, the CRC uh, from, from the 1970s. And the reason why we would consider this in a database system today is because there's actually CPU instructions to do this very efficiently. Um, and so some systems like ClickHouse will use, and Hyper, I think, use CRC for CRC32 for integers. Because again, it's going to be sol solar instructions, and it's good enough. Uh, you know, the collision rate is good, is good enough. Remember hash is sort of the, the, one of the, this is one of the first like, sort of modern hash functions that started the new era in 2008. And actually, I think this was invented by the guy that runs the SM Hasher website. Um, as far as I know, it was just some general, some random dude put this thing on GitHub and put it on the internet. And people just started using it. Um, and I think it's up to Murmur Hash 3. And in one of the papers, they talk about how you can use Murmur Hash 2. You can use that and actually in SIMD to do the vectorized lookups in, in a hash table. And so over the years, it's gotten better. Google then forked Murmur Hash and created City Hash. Then they had a follow up called Farm Hash, which is a, it just does better collision, I think, for, for longer, longer strings. And then Facebook has this thing called XX Hash, which is up to like version 3. And that one, again, for perform the performance and Collision rate for XX hash is, is, is pretty good. So, probably memory hash, XX hash, and the combination of, of CRC32 is, is probably what, what you would want to use. Yes? It sounds like for any given algorithm, you might be able to engineer data that it will pro probably perform badly on. So, when you say better collision rates, do you say better on average or another given workload? Yes, yeah, so the question is like, if I say, okay, could you come up to generate cases that make one hash function be terrible? Yes. Uh, and so what this thing basically is try to try to throw everything at it and figure out you know, what works the best and doesn't work the best. And then like, what's the right trade-off between like, collision rate versus performance? Again, perfect hash function will have zero collisions, but it's going to be super slow. Because you need a hash function. You need a hash table for your hash table. Uh, but like I said, in CRC32, it, you know, it's going to be really, really fast, but it may have a higher collision rate. Again, it, it's hard to decide. And then you, you, people just pick one. Or they'll pick a hash function for, for integers and a separate hash function for strings. All right, so now with our, ha our hash function, we talk about what the hashing scheme can be. So some of these I think we covered in the intro class, but I'm going to go over them quickly again. And I think the, the two ones I want to sort of focus on are Robinhood hashing and hopscot, hopscot hashing. Um, because the, I think the paper talks about linear probing, but there's a previous paper from the same Germans from the paper you guys read, that says Robinhood hashing usually works out. Uh, and then this is what the Umber guys are going to use in, in their paper. Uh, but then it, you know, it's, it's, I think it's still up, up for debate whether which, which one's actually better. Because people try Robinhood hashing, and it turns out it actually doesn't always work as well. All right, so chain hashing, this is what most people think about when they have a hash table or, or a hashing scheme. And this is what you get, I think, for the SDL. The standard type of libraries, unordered map is this. The Java hash map is this, right? And the idea is that the, you're going to maintain a, a list of buckets. And these buckets are going to have pointers uh, to, a, to a linked list. And then whenever I have a collision, I follow along the, my, my chain to find the next free slot to, to store something. Right? And the, the length of each chain within a given bucket can vary depending on the, uh, the number of entries in it. So really simple looks like this. Right? Say I have my bucket pointers, and here's my buckets. Right? So I want to put key A in. I hash it, it take, takes me to one of these bucket pointers, and then I jump to the, the first location uh, of, of my, my, my chain for this bucket, and I find a first free slot, and I store A. Right? No surprise there. 
say anything B, the first, first bucket's empty, he stores it right away. In case of C, now I have a collision because it wants to go where A is, but I just do a sequential scan within my bucket until I find the, the, you know, the, the first free slot and I store it. In case of D, D wants to go in this, in this bucket as well, but now since you know, I'm only showing two entries per bucket, so it's, it's obviously small, but now since th this thing is, is full, I have to extend my, my chain out to it further like that, right? This all should, should be pr pretty understandable. Oops, sorry. So the one trick that the hyper guys do, which I don't think is discussed in this paper, um, but they, they mention it in the Morsels paper, you got, or the, um, is it the Morsels paper or the, uh, the, the compilation paper. So they recognize that this, this array of, of pointers here, uh, since in x86, even though when you say give me a pointer, it's 64 bits in memory, the harbor actually only looks at 48 bits. And so they say, hey, let's go take those extra 16 bits that aren't being used by the hardware, and let's stash something in there. So they put a 16-bit bloom filter inside, inside the, the, uh, in the pointer. The hardware ignores it, but they know to interpret that the you know, first 16 bits as a, as a bloom filter. So that they'll use that to, to, to check to see whether the key even looked for could even exist in, in my hash table or in my chain, right? And it's clever because it's like, this thing's, I got to read this thing anyway. It's going to be in you know, L1 cache, or L, L, you know, in my last level cache. So let me go put as much information I can to potentially avoid scanning along a chain and find nothing, right? So now when I, when I do a lookup at get G, I check the bloom filter first. If it's, not, if it's not in there, then I know I don't need to follow the chain. So the next approach is do open address and hashing. Uh, and this one is probably more common than the chain hashing, for, especially for joins. Um, and the idea here is that I just have this giant you know, slot, uh, table of slots. Um, and when I want to do a lookup, I hash something. I, I modify the number of slots I have. I land in some location in this giant table, or giant array. And if the slot is empty, then I put my thing in there. Or if the slot is full, then I keep scanning sequentially until I find, the thing, until I find a free slot, and then I can put my entry in there. Or if I end up wrapping around, come back to where I, where I started that, then I know I'm in infinite loop, and I have to stop and resize. And then when you want to do a deletion, or sorry, when you do, when you do a lookup, you same thing. You 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 jump to that location, look to see whether the thing you want is there, uh, and keep scanning until, until maybe you find it. So that approach will be linear scanning, and this is what most people think of when again when you think of an open address hash table. There is variations called quadratic uh, probing. The basic idea is that instead of scanning sequentially, you just use a, a, a quadratic equation to, to jump to exponentially larger uh, uh, hops. Why would you ever want to do quadratic? His, his question is, why would you ever do quadratic? Because it avoids clustering. Because if different keys won't always be jumping to the same uh, bunch of locations. But the downside is now you're doing much you know, even more random access. And you may be, you know, but it, there's, again, there's no free lunch. There's pros and cons about these approaches. Most systems are going to do uh, linear scanning. Again, this is just a rehashing of the intro class. Same thing. I take, take I want to put A in, I hash it, I come to this first slot, it's empty, I can put my thing in there. Same thing with B. With C, since it, it hashes this slot, but A's in there, so I just scan down to the next one and I find a free slot and I put it in there. All right. D, same thing goes here. E starts where it wants to go where A is, so I keep scanning down until I find the free slot, and I, then I can put uh, E. And F goes here at the bottom, right? And in this case here, if I say I try to put something that hashes to, uh, you know, to, I put in one more key and this gets, gets full, now I try to put one, one, another one in, then it's going to loop around and I have to keep track of where I started to, to avoid it breaking out, right? So the, the obviously downside of linear probing is that, or an open addressing scheme, is that I'm potentially getting very far away from, you know, if my, my hash gets full, I'm going to put a key in pr pretty far away from where it actually want, wants to be. So now when I go do a lookup, I may have to scan a bunch of entries that aren't the thing I, I, I want. Uh, and you know, in the worst case scenario, I, I could almost wrap around to the, the very beginning and to find, find what I'm looking for, right? So the way to, the way to avoid this, you know, having this, this infinite loop, is you just try to double the, make your hash table be double the size of the number of keys you're going to put into it. And again, we know the number of keys we're going to put into it because you know, we, we know the number of tools are coming up. 
right? so, and we you could allocate things ahead of time. If we get it wrong, then we have to you know we have to resize. So you always sort of a good approximation is is to just two double number of keys I expect to have, and on the resize you just double it again. So there was this observation in the '80s that recognizes this obvious problem with with the linear probing scheme or open addressing, and they came up with an idea that tried to, to, to limit the number of, 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 of look, uh, lookups I have to do when I'm starting to read the hash table. Again, on the, in, in, a, in a hash join, we have these cl clearly two phases where I'm going to build it, and I'm going to then probe it. And I want the smaller relation to be always on the, the build side, because I want my hash table to be as small as possible. And so the idea is that what if I spend a little more extra instructions on the build side to reorganize my hash table so that when I do my probes, the, the length of, of the, or the distance I have to go look potentially to find the thing I'm looking for is potentially reduced. So the two approaches to do this are the Robinhood hashing and the Hopscot hashing. And the Robinhood hashing came out in the 80s, Hopscot hashing came out uh, in, the, in the 2000s. And the idea here is that rather than the, when I, just like in, in it's, it's an open dressing hash table, but as I'm trying to find my, my slot, Instead of just trying to say, what's the first free one, go put my thing in there, I actually look at the entries that are in the place where I want to be, and I can decide whether to go steal their slot. And the, I, the goal is that, the idea is that the, you want to minimize the average distance that any key is from where it should be by swapping keys that are uh, farther away from where they want to be versus keys that are closer. Right? It's, it's like stealing from the rich to give to the poor, hence, hence the name Robin Hood hashing, right? So the, 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 the more recent research from the, from the, from the, the Starlin Germans, for the paper you guys read, they talk about how Robin ha hashing is actually the, the better approach, better than, than linear hashing. Um, the hyper guys, or the umber guys, in their latest paper in 2021, they also use Robin Hood hashing, citing the Starlin paper about why you'd want to do this. Um, but every so often, you see various database companies try out Robinhood hashing, and it actually doesn't pan out in the real world. So I'm not trying to pick on these guys, QuestDB, but this is the most recent one that I found. So they had a blog article came out in November last year that says, hey, look, we, we swapped out our hash map with the new, uh, to do joins with this new fast map implementation. They're in Java, but we can ignore that for now. Um, and at the very bottom of this, they're all, they're all happy to have, the, have this nice hash table. It's better than the, the chain hash table in um, in, uh, in, in Java, because now they're using open addressing or linear probing. But then there's this little blurb at the bottom here that says someone on Reddit told him, hey, you should try Robinhood hashing, right? And he talks about, oh, yeah, the early numbers actually look pretty good. We think we want to do this, right? But then if you, if you follow the pull request link here uh, from November, you go to the very bottom where now in January he says, well, it turns out Robinhood hashing made things worse. Uh, so they end up turning it off, reversing it, right? Uh, a few years ago, we had the InfluxDB people show up, and they were all boasting how they were using Robinhood hashing. Dave Anderson was in the audience. He asked them, why are you doing this? And they said, oh, we saw someone in Hacker News said to use it, so they used it. Right? But then it turns out, I think it made things slower, too. Right? So to me, it's, I think this is still an open question. I don't know what's the best one to use at this point. But it's good to understand what Robinhood and Hopscotch are actually doing. All right, so again, the basic idea is that it's just like linear probing. When I want to store something in, I'm going to store it you know, at the, at the first location that's free in, in, my, in my slot array. But then in addition to storing the, the key or the hash key, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second, and the payload of the value, I'm also going to store the number of jumps I am from where I should have been when I hashed directly into it. So in this case here, when we hashed A and put it in, there wasn't any else in the slot, so it, its position or its distance is 0. So now when I B, same thing, distance is 0. So now I want to put C in. C wants to go where A is, so it can't. But now I compare from where C wants, the distance C is from where it wants to go, from where A is from it where it should be. In this case here, they're both 0. So C is not going to steal a slot, and it goes down to the next one. But now that I store that it's, it's one hop away from where it wants to be. So now when D wants to, to go where C is, at the very beginning, D's, you know, the number of hops that it is from where it wants to be is 0. And that's less than D, or sorry, C, which is 1. So D cannot steal from C, so we leave C alone, and then D is going to go right here, and then its hop is, is 1. Now, I want to start E. Same thing at the very beginning. E, A is 0 hops away. E is 0 hops away at this step. So leave them alone. 
Now we get down here, uh, C is one hop away, E is one hop away, leave that one alone. But now when we get here, D is one hop away because I wanted to go where C was, but now E is two hops away because I wanted to go where A is. So in this case here, E is allowed to steal from, from D, right? shoot him in the head, take its slot, and then D pops out and we got to put it back down into the next slot. And we would run that same protocol. If there was something else here, we would decide whether we want to steal that slot or not. Right? And then F, again, same thing goes like this. Yes? So inserts can be really, really, really slow. His question is, can, can inserts be really, really slow? Yes. Right? Because what are we doing? We're copying. Furthermore, we're doing a bunch of branch mispredictions. Right? Because we got to do if then else's to figure out whether we want to steal or not. So, but again, now, when I do lookups, the, you know, if I'm looking for, uh, you know, if I'm looking for E, for example, well, it could have been here, but I'm going to get it here. So I'm going to get one, 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 you know, one fewer hop doing the lookup. So again, is, is, this, is the trade-off always the right thing to do to pay you know, a higher cost on the right side to make the read side go faster or the, the build side versus the probe side? Same thing with partitioning. It's a bunch, of, you know, a bunch of extra work I'm doing before I even do the other two steps in my join. But ideally, I'm setting things up to make things faster when I run later. Yes? The question is, do you have to still look for more values, otherwise you get a false negative? Why would you get a false negative? You can't. Uh, because you don't know if um, it's definitely at that, that the position you expect it to could, could actually end up at a uh, position for the job. So, so if, I look, if I'm looking for F, maybe I'm going back. Say I look for, what was it, E wanted to be here, right? Yes. Or say I'm looking for D. So D would start here. D was a D Whatever, it doesn't matter. So I, say it starts here. I'm going to scan through until I find D or I find an empty slot. If I find an empty slot that I know doesn't exist, so I don't have a false negative. But, you have to go until that empty slot. but I, would, I would have to do that with linear probing anyway, without, without Robinhood hashing. Yes? So total, total jump, the dimension of the jump should be the same, right? Like, the question is what, sorry? I mean, the, the total of the, the jump should be the same, right? Oh, like the, the, sorry, this thing? The summation across all entries should be the same uh, uh, as, as, as linear probing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yes. Yeah, but like overall, they should, there should be like the same amount of jumps. Like either you do the or not. Yeah, so, 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 so he's pointing out, and he's correct, that like even though I'm rebalancing things so that I try to minimize the jumps, right, of, of, or the distance between one position for where it should have been, it's the same as if I, if, I did, if I didn't do the shuffling thing, right? But like, depending on what keys I'm trying to look up, I may be, you know, if, if I'm highly skewed on, on the looking up the same key and over again, and that key is closer than what it should have been, then I, it might, I might be in a better position. But you can't algor algorithmically prove that because it depends on the data. But you don't know which, which keys you can be. That's what I'm saying. You don't know what keys it is. You can't algorithmically prove it. You know, the goal is in practice that this works out for certain, for certain distributions of data. Would you be able to The question is, would you be able to prevent long scans from data that doesn't exist by putting a blueprint in front of this? Yeah, yeah we'll see this in, in a second with joins. Yes. Right. <coughs> we put bloom filters everywhere. Right. All right. So again, this one is um, this one can swap forever, right? Like, like it doesn't try to bound the, the you know how how far things are actually going to be. The modern variation called hopscotch hashing, hashing is is an extension of this, but the idea is that we can still move things around, like in Robinhood hashing, but we only move things around if it can be in the same neighborhood. There's a way to sort of artificially restrict where, how far we can move something away from where it should have been, right? And then if we can't find something in our neighborhood, then we know it doesn't exist, right? Likewise, if we try to reshuffle things and there isn't room in the neighborhood where something needs to go, then we say our hash table is too big and we have to stop what we're doing and resize it, right? So the goal is, again, to have the cost of accessing a neighborhood be the same as finding a key, because if we size our neighborhoods to be within cache lines and things are nicely aligned, then it doesn't matter whether we're looking for a you know, key in the last position in the neighborhood or the, or the first key position in the neighborhood. Since we brought out everything in our CPU caches anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's the same. So for this one, for simplicity, we're going to say that our neighborhood size is 3. 
So you would say for the first three, three slots, that's neighborhood one, next three slots, neighborhood two, and so forth, and, and, and they're overlapping. In the case of the last neighborhood, six, again, that's the last two positions, and then it wraps around. We would have a, you know, a seven would be here as well, right? So now when I, when, when I want to do a lookup, or sorry, insert A, A hashes this position here, so that goes into neighborhood three. So we can say A can go anywhere inside neighborhood three. So because the table is empty, we'll put it in the first position. Same thing for, for B, it wants to go where neighborhood one is, the, that neighborhood is empty, it goes in the first position. So now we take C, and it, and it wants to go in this neighborhood, and it gets just like linear probing, where the first position is, is full, I scan down until I find the, the next free slot, and that's where I store that. That's fine. So now I want to store D, same thing. D wants to go where C is, that's, a, that's neighborhood four. So in this case here, we just scan through, and it goes here. So now we put E in. So E wants to go in the same neighborhood where A is in. So when we scan through, we'd say, OK, this neighborhood is full. So what we got to do is figure out what we, what we can take out of the neighborhood where it wants to be, put it into another neighborhood, uh, and that way we can put D into, uh, or sorry, put E into, into neighborhood three. So you'd have to basically go look and keep track of, OK, for, for A, C, and D, which ones are not in neighborhood three? So A and C both hash to this location, so neighborhood three, but or sorry, A and, D, A and D both hash to this position, so they're in neighborhood three. But C hash to this position, so it's neighborhood four. So there's, in neighborhood four, there's a free slot. So I'm allowed to move, uh, is that right? Uh, no, yeah, this would be D. Yeah, D is allowed to move down by one. Uh, and then now I can go ahead and put uh, E in this neighborhood here. This is, seems really complicated compared to the first, like Robin Hood. The statement is this seems very complicated to the Robin Hood and linear probing. Yes, absolutely, yes. But it take longer then, much longer, to actually put data stuff. Sure, absolutely, yes. So the, they were paying, since you're building the hash table, we're always paying the cost of building it. It would be faster, right? But it's only like limited by a certain amount. Right? Simplicity is better in this case here. On a modern CPU, right. nobody does this. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I'll, I'll show one graph at the end. I, That's right. I think Robinhood be beats this right. in, the, in the click house uh, uh, measurements, yes. His question, her question is, what happens if you can't move anything in the neighborhood? You have to say, this, my hash table is full. Even though, obviously, you have free slots, and later probing, that would not be an issue. For this scheme, it is. You stop what you're doing, resize, and you double the size of the hash table, and repopulate it. Then you get into questions of like, OK, well, like, you know, if I'm doing late materialization, then repopulating the hash table maybe isn't that big of a deal. Uh, but if I have the full tools, I've got to put back in the hash table, then that's expensive. But in the case of QuestDB, they store a separate heap of the of the of the the actual data, which is off the values are just offsets, which we haven't covered what this actually is, and so that way you can resize it without having to copy any of the tuples themselves, right? There's pros and there's. The worst version of hashing. is this the worst version of extendable hashing? This? Yeah. Uh, this would be better faster than extendable hashing, but because uh, like the idea is like you say, okay, I I know I'm gonna my I'm gonna have a, a million tuples, I'm gonna pick. Uh, a hash table that can hold 2 million slots. And hopefully, I don't have collisions there. All right, super short on time. Um, let me quickly bring up cuckoo hashing. Sometimes it's called double hashing. Basically, the idea is that instead of one hash function, we can have multiple hash functions to figure out where things go. Right? So I want to put A in. So I'll have two different hash functions. Basically, it's the same hash algorithm, like murmur or, or, or xx hash which is with different seeds to make sure that it has a different distribution of values. So I'm going to hash both of them and, fig and find a for the first free slot. In this case here, they're both empty because the table's empty. So I'll flip a coin and maybe pick the first one. So first one, so I'll put A there. Next, he comes along. B, it hashes to these two free slots, or two slots here. One of them's occupied. One of them's empty. I always choose the empty one, and I put B in there. C comes along. Now, C wants to hash where B went, and it hashes where A went. So both are occupied. I got to pick one to, to, to kill them and, and take their slot, right? It's like Robin Hood hashing, but instead of moving it down, I'm going to literally pull it out. So say we're going to go kill the first guy, B. So C takes its slot. B comes out. Now we've got to hash it again. Since we know that when we put it in the first time, we use this, the second hash function. When we come back the, the, the next time, we'll use the first hash function. But now when, when we go to insert it, uh, it goes where A is. Right, so, so we got to go take it, its slot. A comes out. We hash it again with the second hash function. And now we find a, a free entry. 
right? Yes? But the lookups are bounded to just two, right? His question is, if lookups bounded by two, yes. So you have O1 lookups yeah. by, paying, by doing this ahead of time. Yes? Can you get like, oh, like a loop of hashes where like they all? His question is, just like, just like in linear probing and all the other hash schemes, I can get, in, I, I can get stuck in an infant loop where uh, say something was here and I pull that out and it hashes back to something else. And I, get, yeah, I, have, to, I have to keep track of where I went into to avoid infinite loops. Right, so now when I do a lookup to his point, it's always going to be O1 because I just hash it twice and then I, I jump to two locations and I can figure out which one I want. So cuckoo hashing is used in a couple systems. DB2 Blue uses this uh, and I think one or two others. I can't remember. Uh, but I, I remember looking this up before and other systems are using this. Uh, yes? A lot of these seem to be optimized for like read-only workloads. Like they, they sacrifice inserts a lot. Is that intentional? Were they designed for something else rather than the databases? His statement is, these seems like the, these are made for read-only workloads. Uh, they seem to be ignoring the hash build phase and the cost of it. Uh, right, but like, his statement is, like, you're ignoring the hash build phase. Because most of the data structures, like, think of this almost like a, you're using this as a hash index. It's, it's, it's write once, read many. So yeah, the inserts are more expensive, but I'm going to make my reads go faster. That's a, for, especially for databases, that's a, that's a fair trade-off. All right, we're way, 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 way behind on time. Um, hey, uh, you know, we'll have to pick up where we left off um, and come back on, um, on Monday, unfortunately. Unless people have to run, because we're, should we just plow through it? All right, let's plow through it, okay. <laughs> All right, cool. If you got to go, if you go, all right. So what's actually we're putting on hash table? We're kind of unclear, and the paper doesn't really say, right? So the first, first thing we got to figure out is, are we actually storing the tuples themselves, or storing pointers or offsets to tuples? In some cases, if, in the case of QuestDB, that in their system, they store the, the tuples actually in a separate heap, and you just have offsets into them. So now when I resize, I'm just moving around those offsets and not the actual data itself, right? Uh, or if I'm having these buffers coming in, if I maintain those, those input buffers, then I just have offsets into those, and I don't have to store the actual data. But now that means when I do certain lookups, or I mash the tuples together that, that, that are being joined, I got to then do, you know, dereference that pointer or follow along to figure out what the actual data is. If you have variable length data, then you can't put that in a, in a hash table or with open addressing because every slot has to be the same length. Next question is, are we actually storing, what are actually storing as the sort of the key portion of the hash table, right? Because again, because there'll be collisions, I actually need to compare the actual join keys uh, from the input tuple versus what's actually in the hash table. So I could just store the original tuple, and that would that could be expensive. But also, we'd because um, it's a variable length, and you can't you know that's going to screw up your slots. So in some times, you actually want to store the hash, uh, you know, the hash you computed when you inserted it, along with the original join keys, so that you can do a quick comparison just based on the join the hash the hash keys rather than having to do like a you know expensive string comparison. So different systems do different things, and this is a classic compute versus storage. If I only store the join keys and not the hash, then my data structure is going to be smaller, but now when I do comparisons, it'd be more expensive potentially, because I have to basically you know, look at raw keys. All right, the probe side, there really isn't anything fancy we can do, because it's literally just ripping through the input, feature ve the input vector and probing hash table and looking for matches. But the one trick we can do is what he asked about is uh, adding bloom filters. Um, and so th this is the, the idea is that when we're building the hash table, in addition to populating the hash table, we'll also populate a, a, a bloom filter, right? And so I build the hash table, but I also build a bloom filter, and then I pass that over to on the probe side. So now when I do my, my probe, I first check the bloom filter. If there's no match, then I know I, it's not going to be in the hash table, so I don't bother looking at the hash table. Because again, bloom filters can have false positives, but not false negatives. So I'll know that something could not possibly exist. And it's way cheaper and way faster to look at the bloom filter rather than probing the hash table, right? So this is sometimes called si sideways information passing. I think the technique, I think the, there's a vectorized paper that talks about it. There's a Vertica paper from 10 years ago that talks about it. Uh, a bunch of systems do this technique. The Hyper guys do this. The Umbra does it as well. The Umbra, again, they, they'll have this bloom filter for this, but also have a bloom filter within that as well to see whether you need to follow along the chain. All right. So quick benchmark. So we're going to look at the paper you guys read, uh, and we'll read the, and then uh, some, some uh, 
a paper that, from the hash table that ClickHouse guys use for strings. And again, I'm going through this very, very fast. But it's basically going to have the, the no partitioning basic scheme, but then it's going to have the, the different radix partitioning st stuff we talked about. Um, they have a concise hash table from IBM, IBM DB2 Blue. I think it's like a packed array with like a balloon filter in front of it. We, we can ignore that. No, no other system, no system other than DB2 Blue uses it. So we're going to have sort of like the, the vanilla implementations, that, like based on what's in the, I think the open source versions of these of these algorithms and the, as it's described in the in the papers, and then they'll have the the you know their optimized versions that do a bunch of the techniques that we talked about. So here's all the different uh, variations of these. Um, and over here, again, this is that sort merge that I talked about that came from the, the Intel Oracle paper, right? Um, and so the region here, which you can't really see, this region over here is going to be all the optimized versions. Uh, and then these are the symbols that they're using. So they basically say that like, if you do radix partitioning for either a chain, chain hashing, linear probing, or open addressing, or a really basic array, like that's always going to be the fastest. Uh, if your data is can nicely fit in an array, you, know, you can get a little faster as well. But if you add, do, don't do any of these radix partitioning, no specialization, Again, making sure you get all this correct for the actual hardware that you're running on is non-trivial. This is actually going to be pretty, pretty good for most things, for almost all things, and requires less engineering overhead than, than all these other ones. What is the difference between linear and array? Arrays? Arrays literally like, like uh, the indices are hash keys. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, it's like, yeah, the, the indices are the hash keys, yes. Right? OK. So then the next, the next graph they show is, is this thing here that says, OK, well, how much time in a real query is actually being spent on the, on the, on the hash join. And for all these different approaches, you can see that it's, it's basically 10% or less, or 13% or less, uh, being spent just doing the hash, hash join. And everything else is the rest of the query, like getting the data, reading the data in, doing any filtering, materializing the output, doing any other stuff up above in, in the query plan. Right, this is TPCH query 19. So again, hash join is super important, but it's not the, the high pole in the tent, the most important thing we should be optimizing for. But so for, for this reason, that's why I think the, uh, you know, this, this implementation here is going to be the, the, the no partitioning linear approach would be the easiest to implement and good enough for most things, right? All right, so let me show you one graph also, too, that wasn't in the paper. This is from another paper from uh, it's some random workshop or conference I've never heard of. Uh, but the, the ClickHouse guys basically took their implementation, or they, they sent a PR, and this is what this is the data structure that ClickHouse uses for doing hash joins or hashing for hash tables for strings. And the basic idea of how it works is that it's a single logical hash table, but underneath the covers they have a four different variants of a hash table for the different strings of different sizes. So they'll have one that's like for strings that are 16 bytes, here's a hash table. Here's one that's you know 17 to 32, and they have different op optimizations for all of them. So what I like about this paper is because they just ran everything on this one workload of doing joins and group eyes. And you can see how their thing is the best. So this art index is, is, a, is the radix try um, from, from the Germans, from Hyper. You're not really not supposed to use it for joins. It's, a, it's, like a it's a replacement for a B plus tree, but they did it for that. Uh, but you see the chain hash table. You can see the hopscotch hashing, the cuckoo hashing, Robin Hood hashing. The F14 table is from Facebook. The Swiss table is from um, the Swiss guy left. It's from, uh, it's from Google, thank you. And then here, lo, lo and behold, here's our vanilla off the shelf linear probing hash table. And then their thing is squeaking out a little bit better. Because again, this is for specifically for strings. Right? Yeah, there's, unfortunately, there's no ClickHouse paper. They do a lot of crazy stuff. They have like, like, like I think, so many different variations of hash tables uh, and, and a bunch of different ways of doing joins. But they don't, their blog articles are pretty good. And you kind of sometimes go into the covers and understand what's actually going on. ClickHouse is a really fascinating system. Just, they, the guy told me that they have a VLDB paper they're actually working on now. So hopefully we can cover that next year. Uh, yes? Why is Linear better than? Because it's so simple, right? That's the whole point of it. Like, simple is better, right? OK. Again, I've already said this. Partitioning is, is, is faster than no partitioning, but getting it right is challenging. Again, it's not just me. The Germans and others say the same thing. And most of them are going to pick one implementation and not try to be clever about it. Yes, quickly. His question is, like, d d given these results, does it make sense to have a specialized, very well length string hash table? Yes. Uh, if you can get random people to write it for you, sure. But if you're just starting off, this, linear probing. OK? All right.
Uh, so again, next class, we'll do worst case optimal join. We'll spend a little bit of time on do profiling performance counters. And then again, reminder, Wednesday next week will be the uh, status update presentations for the projects, okay? Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I'll guzzle cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw my three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the paint I red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the chili cheese, so down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Isles.